Well, I was, uh, I was reading a story this week as I was preparing uh, for this sermon and it just totally popped out to me. Uh, it was a medical mystery. It was a study that was published in 2019 about this 14-year-old boy in England who uh, he went to the doctors one day because he said he was experiencing just constant fatigue. He was always tired and they, his parents couldn't figure out why. He didn't know why and he just felt really lethargic, really tired all the time. And uh, so he went to the doctors and the doctors looked him over and this boy looked like a normal, healthy 14 year old boy, normal weight and you know, everything looked fine. They ran a bunch of tests. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. So they said, well, maybe he just needs some vitamins. So they gave him some vitamin B hoping that would help with his fatigue and they sent him on his way. Well, the boy continued to decline. And by the time he was 15, he began to lose some of his sight and some of his hearing. He began to have he sight and, he and hearing loss. And the doctors, again, they looked him over. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with this kid. They had no idea why his hearing was starting to go, why his vision was starting to go, and why he was still always tired all the time, and they couldn't figure it out. And so the boy continued to decline until at the age of 17, he went blind. And finally... After doing more tests, they still couldn't figure it out. But finally, they cracked the case. They, felt they solved the mystery. After talking to the family, they realized that the boy was what his parents called, quote unquote, a fussy eater. Uh, apparently, ever since he was in elementary school, this boy, because he only liked certain textures and flavors, he only ate a steady diet of, get this, French fries, Pringles potato chips, not other potato chips, Pringles specifically, white bread, and sliced deli hams and sausage. That was all this kid would eat. And so the, he, he looked normal. He, didn't, he wasn't super overweight or anything like that. He looked like a normal, healthy kid, but he wasn't getting the nutrients he needed and he was severely malnourished and it caused irreparable damage to his, his sight. And now we look at this story and we go, oh my goodness, that poor kid. But also we would never do that. We know so much better, don't we? Like we, we would never do something that foolish, right? Because this kid, if he would have just ate his fruits and vegetables, right? He would have been fine. He would have had, had a proper diet, all that things, right? But uh, we would never do that. But before we get so high and mighty on our own high horse, here's, here's something I, I think is true and that may be very true of some of us in this room today. I think many of us, like this young boy who was malnourished and didn't even know it, physically we might be okay, but spiritually, I think there's many of us who are spiritually malnourished and we're walking around and we don't even realize it. And so I wonder how many of us today don't even realize that we came here to church today and we are sorely lacking what we need from God. Um, Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter four, verse four, quoting the book of Deuteronomy, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we, we have to understand that our existence is more than just physical, right? Physical health and physical nutrition, that's all important and that's all good. But there's, if, if we want to thrive and we want to flourish in this life, there's more than just the physical. There's also a spiritual component of what it means to be a human. And in order for us to thrive and to have the best life that God has created for us to live, we have to understand that we don't just live by bread alone. We need to thrive on a steady diet of the word of God. We need scripture in our life. We need God in our life so that we can be healthy, not just physically, but spiritually. But how many of us are spiritually malnourished and we don't even know? Uh, I was looking at some studies this week. Uh, the American Bible Society does a study every single year of kind of the, just the level of Bible, uh, how, how the U.S. feels about the Bible. Uh, and in 2021, so just this year, according to the American Bible Society and the Barna Research Group, they put this out. Um, look at this graph here, if you can see it. It says, Bible use frequency among U.S. adults this year, okay? So they ask the question, how often do you use the Bible on your own? And you look about it, uh, the front, the, the left side of that, about roughly, if you look at it, about 25% of U.S. adults would read the Bible, what I would say regularly, which means more than once a week. If you're reading it once a week, that might just mean you're showing up at church and the preacher put one up on the screen and you read the Bible. You're like, done, check, <laughs> right? Um, but if you're doing it more than once a week, that means you're probably doing it on your own somewhere, right? So I would say about 25% of those are regular Bible readers that you're doing it at least more than once a week. Now, if you look then again, the back half that, that number's wrong, actually. It's a typo on the slide. It should be 58%. But 58% of people in America, of U.S. adults, rarely, if ever, crack open the Bible. Rarely, if ever. The, the people in the middle there, I'm assuming, it's just kind of when they go to church or once a week or once a month. 
And so uh, look in the far right side, that really tall graph, that's the people who'd never, ever open a Bible. It's just not a part of their life. Now, here's another, here's another one they put out is U.S. adults' perceptions of the Bible in America. They asked the question, do you think our country would be worse off, better off, or the same without the Bible? And 54% of people, which is a, a slight majority, says we would be worse off, which I would agree with, right? I'd hope you all agree with too. If we did not have the Bible, just imagine where we would be if we didn't have God's word guiding us in how to live. What would be the state of our country if we did not have his word? Now, 33% of U.S. adults said wouldn't matter. It'd be about the same. Whether we have the Bible, we don't have the Bible, eh, doesn't matter. And then 14% say we'd just be better off. If we didn't have the Bible, the country would be a better place. Here's another one, uh, and, and then I'll stop showing you graphs and data, I promise. Um, but I nerd out on this stuff. Uh, here's, here's another one. U.S. scripture engagement uh, if, over the last four years, uh, the last, was that, four years? Four years, 2018, 2019, 2021, right? Uh, the following number represents just millions of people. So uh, this is a graph of uh, the, over those last four years, people who they would list as disengaged with the Bible, who are kind of in the middle, kind of they're not really disengaged, they're not really engaged, they could go either way. And then the people who are engaged. Now, the good news here is there are less people disengaged with the Bible than there have been in previous years. And I wonder if the pandemic last year may have been a part of that because when the world's kind of going apocalyptic, everybody wants to know what the Bible says, right? So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if that might have helped a little bit. And you notice the people in the middle, um, right there in the movable middle, has really grown. So um, maybe there are less people engaged in the Bible than there were last year, which is a little bit sad. But there's a lot more people who are right there on the middle. And now this is exciting, but this is also dangerous, Right? They could go one way or the other. Either they could be interested, they could, they could love the Bible, or they could say that has nothing to do with my life, that we would be better off, doesn't even matter, it's inconsequential, I don't need God's word in my life. Uh, so there's a lot of people who are on the fence right now. And so I just want to ask us all in this room today, where would we fit in on this statistics? Where would we fit on this survey? Is the Bible a regular part of our life? Are we regularly hearing the word, reading the word, studying the word, or is it completely inconsequential where if you took the Bible away from you, would your life change? Would your life be any different if you didn't have a Bible? Because many of us, I think, might be spiritually malnourished and we may not even be aware of it. And so my my Hope today is not that this would be like a guilt trip for everybody, okay? But that this would be just an encouragement that we've got to be people who get into the word. So if you got a Bible with you today, turn with me to James chapter one. We're gonna throw it up on the screen as well. But if you got a Bible, go to James chapter one, verse 19. There's Bibles in the pews in front of you. Or if you're at home, grab your Bible as well. If you're watching online, uh, we're gonna be in James chapter one, verse 19. Uh, this week, we're, we're starting a two-week, two-part series. Bill's out of town on vacation, so you're stuck with me for two weeks. So, haha, ha, I'm taking over. Um, <laughs> to, don't tell Bill I said that. He's probably watching online right now. But um, we're going to be in a two-week series. And, and so this week, we're going to be talking James 1, 19 to 22. And then next week, we're going to pick up where we left off in 22 and, and go on to 25. And so uh, go, go with me. Look at this. Here's the Word of God. Chapter 1, verse 19, the book of James. This is what it says. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So according to James right here, we're supposed to be quick to what? Quick to hear, quick to listen, right? Good. And slow to what? Speak. Good. You guys were all catching on to that the first time. You were really slow to answer me. So that was good. All right. You passed the test. Quick to listen, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Yet how often... Do we get that backwards, right? I mean, just look at the last year or so of our country, right? How many people were quick to speak 
and quick to anger over all the things that were going on and thought that they should just shout out all their opinions everywhere they went or on social media or wherever else, right? How many of us leapt to different causes, whether it's political or social justice issues or whatever else, or just things that were going on with the pandemic, right? How many of us just lashed out as fast as we could? We were quick to spout off our opinions. We were quick to get angry and upset about different things, and it got us in trouble. And we were so quick to lash out, we weren't quick instead to listen. We were slow to listen and hear. Uh, it, just ask any married man in the room how many times that has got them in trouble, right? They'll tell you this is true, right? How many married men have been so quick to speak and so quick to get to anger, right? And they should have just closed their mouths and listened to their wife, right? Not that I know from experience, okay? <laughs> but man, we would be saved so much trouble if we just did that, wouldn't we? Uh, whether it's different relationships or political or social justice issues, whatever else it is, we've got to be quick to listen, quick to hear, and slow to speak. Now, quick to hear what? If you read further on, it's quick to hear God's word, not just quick to hear anything. But here's the point we need to understand is if we're so quick to leap to action, we're so quick to leap to, to, to try to do something in our lives, that if we're not careful, we have to understand this. Actions devoid of the truth do not honor God. If we just jump into action so fast, if we jump to speak, if we jump to anger, then we're just going to leap out and we're going to do things. And maybe we have good intentions, but we're actually going to do things that cause more harm than good. Or we're going to give advice to somebody else and we're going to give advice that actually causes, that is bad advice and not good advice because we aren't saturated in the word. We don't know God's word. We don't know the truth. So before we leap to action, the first thing we need to do is we need to listen and not just listen to anybody. Uh, look what... Uh, James 1, 21 tells us, he says, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. So James is saying, look, basically repent, right? Put away all the filthiness, all the wickedness that's in your life, all those sins that we cling to that we know aren't good for us, but for some reason we just keep going back to that thing over and over again. That stuff in our life we know isn't good, but we're clinging to. Put that away, repent, which means turn. Turn away from that, put it down, and go towards what? To God, right? And he says, receive with meekness, with humility, God's word. So it's not just listen to anything, okay? He's being quick to listen. He's, being, he's talking about being quick to listen to God's word because we don't want to just listen to false teachers or false or bad opinions, right? That's not what's going to help us. We need to listen to God. Be quick to listen to him. Put away your wickedness. Repent of those things. Turn towards God and with humility, setting your pride on the shelf, right? Knowing that you don't know everything because God is so much higher and greater than us. You don't know everything. We need to hear from God and what he has to say. Receiving that humbly and being shaped by God. That's what we need in our lives. We need his word. And notice there at the end, he says, which can, is able to save your souls. That's interesting to me. Does reading the Bible save you? No. Okay, that's the answer. Okay, the, the, reading the Bible isn't what does not save you. Okay, you're saved by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Uh, so it's not about something we do that saves us. We can't earn our way and somehow achieve salvation by doing so much good in our lives that somehow our good outweighs the bad in our lives. We are, if you understand scripture, you understand we are desperately wicked and depraved creatures with wicked hearts that will lead us and deceive us all the time. And on our own, left to our own devices, we are not good people, okay? God alone is good. And we are saved through Jesus Christ alone, who's the only one who didn't sin, the only one who died on the cross for our sins in our place, right? So that we could be forgiven and freed by his grace through faith in him alone. So how does it that James is saying that the word is able to save you? Well, how do we come to faith? If faith alone in Christ is what saves us, how do we come to faith? Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Paul writes, and he says, faith comes from what? Hearing. And hearing through what? The word of Christ. So the way that we come to faith is from hearing and hearing what? Hearing about Jesus, hearing the gospel, hearing the word, hearing about God through his word. Uh, before you come to faith, you've got to know what you're coming to faith in. Before you believe in God, you've got to know the God that you believe in, right? Before you uh, know Jesus, you've got to understand the gospel and what he did for you. And how do you do that? You hear the word. And then, you come, and then God allows you to come to faith. Then he calls you to himself. Then you put your faith in Christ, right? After you've heard the word. So we've got to understand the reading the Bible doesn't save you. Doing Bible studies doesn't save you. But the faith that is birthed in your heart through hearing the word, that will save you. And so we got to understand the Bible is so important to us in, in, in a Christian walk and in our lives and the way that we reach out to other people as well. Can't have faith unless we hear God's word. 
And then James reminds us in the very end of that passage in verse 22, and this is what we're going to kind of hang on here today and, and pick up again next week. He reminds us of the importance of not just hearing, but putting our faith into action. In verse 22, he says, but be what? Doers of the word not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So he's saying it's not just about hearing the word. You've got to put it into action, right? If you just hear it and you do nothing with it, what good is that? Nothing, right? You've got to hear the word. You've got to know the word and then you do it. But notice he doesn't say, don't worry about hearing the word. Hearing is implied in this. That's still important. He says, don't just hear only, but he, he assumes you're going to hear. You've got to hear. That's important. So you've got to know the truth. You've got to, li- you got to understand what God says about life and the world and how you should be living. You've got to know the truth. You've got to hear the word. And then you don't just hold on to that to yourself through the, the truth that we've received, then it should reflect in our lives, in our attitudes, in our actions, in the way that we live our lives. Then we go out and we do what God has commanded us to do. So that's where we're going uh, this week and next week. We're doing a, a simple just t- series. It's called Hear and Do, okay? That's, that's as simple as I can make it. Hear and Do. We got to hear the word and then we got to do the word, okay? We got to hear the truth and then we go live out the truth, all right? Hear and do in that order. Don't do first without hearing. You got to hear the truth, and then you go to action. You don't leap to action first, right? Uh, and this is, if you want to make a difference in the world, these are just two small steps that are going to help you make a difference in your life and in the world around you. Hearing the word first, knowing the truth, and then acting on it. So we often make one of two mistakes in this area though, okay? We often make one of two mistakes. The first one is this. I see this a lot in the world. We do and we don't hear, right? We're all uh, action and no truth. And this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, Right? How many people out there in the world that they leap to action, they leap to a cause, they try to do good in the world, they have good intentions and they want to do good, but they actually end up doing more harm than good because they don't know the truth. So before we leap to action, we've got to hear the word. We've got to hear from God. And so look at this. Ecclesiastes chapter five, verse one says it this way. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools for they do not know what they are doing, that they are doing evil. So think about that, okay? Instead of going back in the, this is talking about the Old Testament temple times, right? Better, better, better than going and offering a bunch of sacrifices and having no idea what you're doing and possibly doing it in the wrong way or uh, with the impure motives, doing it as a show just so everyone would see you and you're, how good you are, right? Or whatever else it is. Rather than sacrificing to God in the wrong way, first, what's better? Listen, <laughs> Know the truth. Know how you should be doing things, right? In the same way, when we come before God and we worship God, we need to know the truth first before we go jump out into the world and try to, try to change the world for him. We've got to know the truth of his word first. Or else, if we're not careful, a scary thing is we could do the wrong things. We could do evil and not even realize we're doing evil. Here's another one. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 29, Jesus says this as he's rebuking some religious leaders. He says, you are wrong, Why? Because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. So he's saying, here's how we get things wrong all the time. We don't know the truth. And so we get things wrong, right? If we don't know what God's word says, we could go out and we could get things wrong over and over again. And we could do wrong things. And we won't understand the power of God that works in us and through us in the Holy Spirit as we're soaking up his word. We won't understand the full power of God because we don't know the truth in the scriptures. And we've got to understand that first. Otherwise, if we're not careful, we're wrong like I so often am, right? When we don't come to God's word first and understand what he has to say first, when we leap to action, we speak too quick or we get angry and we jump to action. If we're not careful, we won't know the truth and we could be doing wrong without even knowing it. It's scary. I mean, think about this. Without, without the Bible, we may not even be aware of what good actually is. We can't even, if you just try to get a bunch of people in a room from all different backgrounds and walks of life and just try to settle on a definition of what it means to be good, what is good, we won't be able to agree without some sort of foundation and understanding. God, most people, if you ask most people in society, the, the general consensus is that good is just whatever makes you feel good, as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else. So whatever makes you feel good, whatever makes you happy, as long as it doesn't impose on somebody else's happiness, just do it, enjoy it, go live your life, you know, live your truth, do whatever. Uh, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else and you feel good doing it, do it. That's kind of the world's definition of what good is in the world. Um, but when we read scripture, We understand that what good is, is what God is. God is good. 
He alone is good. And so our definition of good is who God is. And everything that is bad is the opposite of who God is, right? God is holy and righteous and pure and good. And everything that is good is of him. So what is godly, what is like God is good. And what is unlike God is what is bad, right? Sin is a rebellion against God. Sin is the opposite of God's nature. So what's bad is what is not of God. And God defines what good is. So we have to know the truth. We've got to know his words so we know what good is. Otherwise, we might think we're doing good. And again, we might be doing evil and not even know it. So the first mistake we often make is we, we leap to action, we leap to speak, we leap to anger, and we do and we do and we do and we don't know the truth. We don't hear. The second mistake, though, we make, and this is probably more common in the church and among believers, is we hear, we know the truth, and we don't do anything about it. Right? We go to church, many of us, we grew up in church. We heard a lot of Bible stories. We know the word. We, we've been, we've heard hundreds of sermons. We've, we've read the Bibles. We've gone to Bible studies. Like we've done all the things. We did all the stuff. We know the truth, yet our level of knowledge far outpaces our level of obedience. And so we, know, we have the truth. We know the truth. And what do we do with it? Nothing. When, God, when the, the opportunity comes for us to share our faith or talk to somebody else about Jesus, we cower in fear and we hide away and we do nothing with what we know. And that's another problem. We'll talk more about that next week. Okay? But today, this week, I want to just focus on the first part, the hearing part. So why do we need to hear the word? Why do we need to hear the word? I want to just talk a little bit about the importance of scripture in our lives this morning, really briefly, as we kind of go through just a few uh, important points. Okay, here's the first one. Number one, the, the first thing is the Bible is inspired by God. You got to understand that the Bible is the inspired word of God. The words in scripture are God's very words to us. Here's what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So scripture is breathed out by God, is inspired by God. It is written by human authors, but inspired by God through them. So we have, when we read God's words, we, this is God's word to us. It's, it's all inspired by him and it is all useful and profitable so that we could live righteous lives following after God, so that we could be equipped to do every good work. So we hear it, we're inspired by it, right? God's, we, we hear scripture, that's God's word, and then we're equipped to do good works, right? We hear it first though, and it's inspired by God. We gotta understand that. And because the Bible is inspired by God, we can trust it, it is useful, it is helpful. We need it in our lives. If you wanna hear from God, you wanna understand his will for you in your life, the first thing to understand God's will is not just to say, God, what's your will for me, but to read scripture and understand that first. Uh, he's got it laid out for you in many, in many cases. The Bible is inspired by God. Here's another thing. Because the Bible is inspired by God, the Bible is true. The Bible is true. Uh, Jesus says this in John 17, 17. It's the typo there on the screen again. It's 17, 17. It says, sanctify them in the truth. Because your word is truth. So saying, Jesus is saying God's word is truth. He doesn't just say God's word is true. He says God's word is the truth. This is our standard for truth as believers. This is God's word to us. It is inspired by him. And so every word in scripture is true. Why? Because God is true. God is truth. And some people ask sometimes, is there anything that God can't do? And the answer to that is yes. He can't lie. He doesn't do, he doesn't sin, right? He doesn't do anything that's contrary to his nature. So when God speaks, it is true because God cannot and does not lie. He tells us the truth. He doesn't deceive us. He doesn't steer us the wrong direction. God's word is true. And so we can hang our hat on that and we can trust it. We can know that it is truth. And that's our standard. That's our definition of truth is what's in scripture. And think about this. The Bible has been probably the most scrutinized book in human history, right? For thousands of years, it has been scrutinized. It has been attacked and it has continued to hold up and hold true today. No matter how many times people critique it, no how many times people try to get rid of it, it is still held firm and true because it is truth. And it's God's word. All right, and here's another one. The Bible is eternal. Think about this. The Bible is eternal. Well, what does that mean? Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away. So everything in this earth, it's gonna go at some point, Right? Everything in earth is going to fade. It's going to pass away. But what? My words will not pass away. So God's word 
is eternal. It's going to stay. Uh, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the same way Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the same way scripture is the same yesterday and today and forever. You can hold firmly to it because it's eternal. It's never going to change. Uh, think about it this way. The world is so full of change all the time, right? I mean, just this last year, we went through so much change where it seems like things were changing every single day and the world was kind of flipped upside down on its head and we didn't know what was going to be happening. And, and when everything is swirling around you and everything is changing constantly around you, scripture is the same. It is a firm foundation. It is eternal. It is not going to change. And the words in here are not going to mean anything different than they have always meant and, and always will. So you can hold on to that as a firm and stable foundation when everything around you is changing and going crazy. So the Bible's eternal. And here's another one. The Bible reveals your heart. I mean, how many of you have ever had a Bible verse just kind of cut down to your soul and cut you deep, right? Uh, and, and just hit you in a spot that's not a superficial level, but a spiritual level. Uh, here's what the writer of Hebrews says in four, chapter four, verse 12. He says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who we must give account. You see, when you read God's word, it like opens your soul, it like bears your heart and you're exposed before God. It's almost like looking into a mirror sometimes and you see yourself clearly. You see who you are compared to a holy and righteous God and you realize how much you need him. <laughs> how much you can ever live up to his perfect standard of righteousness and how thankful you are for his grace and, and you love him even more because you realize how much you don't deserve his love yet he gives it to you anyway. And the full gift of his grace and his mercy on you is, is seen so much more clearly when you read scripture and understand who he is and who you are. It, ex it opens your soul up to God and it, it, it helps reveal your heart. It reveals the sin in your life. It reveals the problems that you need to work on. It reveals where you need God's grace and mercy and help in your life. It, it reveals your heart. And another one that, that's interesting to me that's really powerful is the Bible guides your life. It's a guide for your life. The psalmist says this in Psalm 119, 105. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I can't tell you how many times where I've been struggling to make a decision or I've been going through life. And this has been a steady and faithful advisor and friend and guide for me in my life helping me make good decisions when I could have easily strayed into making the wrong choices. And the times where I've made decisions and I haven't thought about God's word, I haven't consulted God first, and I've made poor choices because I didn't get into his word first. This is a lamp to your feet. It's a light to your path. I mean, how many of you have ever hurt yourself uh, just stumbling around your, your house at night with the lights off? Anyone? <laughs> I am a clumsy person, okay? <laughs> you got to know that about me. And, and late at night when I want to grab a cup of water or a snack or something else, and I need to walk through my house and the lights are off and I don't want to wake up my wife or my kids, I have hurt myself so many times <laughs> stubbing my toe on something or countertops. They're the worst, aren't they? Like they get me right in the hip every time. <laughs> like I think I got clearance and I just don't. <laughs> and uh, oh, it hurts. But how many people in the world were stumbling in the darkness, we're walking around and we have no light. We have no direction. We have no guidance. And so we're just kind of stumbling through the darkness, trying to figure out our way as we go. And here, right here is what God is saying. This is a lamp for your path. This is a light for you. So as you are walking through life, you don't have to stumble in the darkness. You can look at what God's word says and you can use this to help you see your path more clearly and help you see life more clearly. And it will guide you so you can know the way that God has set it before you, the way that you should be going. It's a guide for you. It's a trusted friend and advisor, and you need to seek it in your life as a guide. All right, and here's one more, and I could go on a bunch more, but here's one more. The Bible transforms your mind. Uh, in Romans 12, 2, we read this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, and this verse is more than just a metaphor, okay? This is what's interesting to me. As we learn more about the brain, the human brain and science and how it works, like neuroscientists have discovered that the more uh, you think similar thought patterns and habits in your life, you actually form neural pathways in your brain and your brain actually transforms and changes shape because of the way that you're thinking and because of the way that you're habitually acting. 
And so most of us were shaped by the world in different, in many, many different ways because there's so many different influences on our life. And so we think different thought patterns and we have different habits uh, that are formed in our brain by the, wor- by the world. But when we study scripture, when we come and we listen to the, the, the word preached, when we read it, when we meditate on it, when we think about it, when we study it for ourselves, what happens? The Bible changes the way we think. It changes the way we see the world. And our brains are not just metaphorically transformed. Literally, we're building new neural pathways and thought processes and habits where our brains are literally becoming more and more like Christ. So we see the world the same way he sees and we think about things the same way he thinks and we're becoming more like God in the way that we think and in our habits. And literally, our brains are being transformed. But it changes the way you see the world, doesn't it? When you understand scripture, when you understand the way that God sees things and the way that God commands things to do. And, and, you know, you can be a Christian for a long time and you wonder, well, how is it that so many other people in the world who aren't believers see things that way? It's because they have not had the same level of uh, scripture intake uh, that you have and your, their thought patterns are different than yours because they aren't operating from an understanding of what God says to be true. And so we start to see and think and feel differently about things because of the way that God is changing us. It's amazing. And we need it. Because otherwise, again, we'll just go willy-nilly on whatever we think is right in our own eyes, and we will lead ourselves (laughs) into all sorts of problems and difficulties. So I could go on and on and on and on about this stuff. But here's here's the point that I want to make is that we need the word. We need the word. We've got to saturate our lives in it. Uh, Jesus said this in John 8, 31. He said, uh, it said, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you got to do what? You got to abide in his word. You've got to live in his word. It's got to be a part of your life. And he says, what? If you know, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You got to understand this. So many people look at the Bible as a list of rules and and just as a buzzkill. Like this is just something saying, oh, don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. All these rules, all these regulations. Ugh, who wants that? And we don't realize that it's not restrictive. It is freeing when you understand what God teaches, when you understand God's commands. It's the same way that a parent sets rules for their kids, right? I don't let my kids play in the street because I don't want them to get hit by cars. It's not because I hate them. It's because I love them. And so I give them the rule, hey, don't go play in the street. Okay, there's other places you can play. Just don't do it here. Don't do it in this way. In the same way, God gives us rules and commands and regulations saying, don't do these things. Why? Because it's not good for you. It's going to lead to your destruction. It may seem good and fun at a time, and it may feel good for a moment, but it's going to lead to regret. It's going to lead to pain. It's going to lead to destruction. It's going to lead to all sorts of other issues. And God knows what's best for us. And when we know his word, it's freeing. It's not restrictive because we will live life the way that God intended us to live and we will understand the grace and the mercy and the love that he has poured out on us and we will be free because of it. So my question for us today is, do we know his word? Are we in his word? Think about this. We've got more access to the Bible now than we ever have before in human history. Uh, we've got more translations, uh, good solid translations in English than ever before. We've got Bible apps. So, I mean, if you're lazy and you don't even want to read the Bible and you're not a reader, you can push a button on your phone and somebody will read it to you. Okay? <laughs> You've got more access to the Bible now than ever before in human history. And you got it one in your pocket if you got it on your phone all the time, right? I mean, we've got more access than ever. Back in the day, that was not the case. There have been men and women throughout history who have bled and died so that we could have this kind of access to the Bible. Um, One example, there's a guy named William Tyndale. He's an amazing guy if you ever have a chance to read his story. Uh, Back in England, way back in the day, when the Catholic Church was in in power, they only allowed people to have the Bible in Latin. So people in in England who spoke English could not read the Bible for themselves unless they understood Latin. And so William Tyndale, who was upset about this and and got really upset about uh, to to some priests and stuff who who didn't have a very good understanding of scripture themselves. He once said this, which is a fascinating quote. I love it. He says this, if God spare my life, ere many years, I will cause the boy who drives a plow to know more scripture than you do. Love that. That's a fiery man right there. <laughs> like, I mean, come on. The farm boy is going to know more scripture than the priest. If I, if I, if, God, if you don't kill me now. And he dedicated his life to making that come true. Uh, he dedicated his life to translating the Bible from the original Greek and Hebrew into English for the first time, even though it was illegal 
and, and punishable by death. And eventually, if you read his story, he didn't get to translate the entire Bible, but he got a whole lot of it done. And he was persecuted, he was imprisoned, and he was eventually burned at the stake for having the audacity to translate the Bible from the original language into English so that the common person could read it. And now today his dream came true and a farm boy can know as much of the Bible as they want. A farm boy can have just as much access to scripture as a priest or a pastor. And you have just as much access to the word today as I do or anybody else. And that's incredible. But we take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. This is a gift. This is a treasure. We've got to hold that high and value it. And so I just want to leave us with this today. Uh, Paul writes this to Timothy one of, his, uh, one of his disciples who he was teaching how to do ministry, he says this to him in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. How true is that today? We have millions of voices out there, don't we? Millions of people in the media saying all their opinions, millions of people on social media telling us how they think, millions of podcasts and other people out there. There There's so many voices today all talking at the same time. And if you want to find somebody who's going to confirm your bias and tell you what you want to hear, you can find them. Anybody who's going to tickle your itching ears, you can find anybody who's going to tell you what you want to hear. And if you're not careful, you're going to wander off in, away from the truth of God's word into myths or other things because you just want to hear what you want to hear and you're not going to base your life on the truth of God's word. So my question for all of us today is, who are you listening to? Are you listening to God? Are you hearing his word regularly? Or are you listening to other people? Are you listening to people who may or may not be right? Or are you listening to the infallible, inspired word of God? You got to hold that, that a, a value in your life. So here's my challenge to all of us. Get in the word this week. If you're not already regularly having the word as a part of your life, if you're not abiding in the word like Christ calls us to, do something this week. Get involved in a class. Start reading the Bible for yourself. Uh, whatever it is, there's so many opportunities here we provide at this church. If you have questions on how to do that, we'd love to help you out. Get in the Word. It's got to be a part of your life. Before you leap to action, before you do, you got to hear first, and then you got to do something with it. But for now, this week, just focus on hearing God's Word, and we'll talk about the doing part next week. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for the gift of your Word. Lord, may we not take it for granted. Lord, may we not take for granted the sacrifice that so many men and women have bled and died for so that we can even have a, a Bible in our hands. And, and Lord, the freedom that we even have in this country where we can open the Bible or bring the Bible with us anywhere we want. God, help us not to take that for granted. That has not always been the case. But Lord, help us to treasure and to value your word. Help us to understand that this is truth and that we need to base our lives on this. Help us to understand that this is a trusted guide and advisor and a friend to us, Lord, as we live our lives and try to, to live in this world. And Lord, may we be a people in this church who hear from you regularly, that we aren't walking around spiritually malnourished, but Lord, we are fed with a consistent and steady diet, a healthy diet of your word. God, we love you. We thank you. Help us just to hear from you this week as we get into your word together. We, Lord, we ask this all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Hey, thank you all so much for coming today. We hope to see you here back next week. God bless. Take care. <laughs>